Good morning, South Point. Y'all made me feel so welcome, so at home. Thank you. So glad to be here. Honored to be here with you all in the absence of your pastor. Really grateful for the invitation and to be able to jump right in with you all as you are in the summer of Psalms. Uh, for today, our passage will be Psalm 34. So before we get in, would you just pray with me? Our God and our Father, we thank you. Thank you for this is the day that you've made. Father, we thank you for you have allowed us to have life on this day. Father, we thank you, Father, for not only where you are our alarm clock, you allowed us to make it into your house of worship, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you, and we thank you for the privilege it is to know you, to be in relationship with you, and to be called yours. So, Lord, we pray right now. In Jesus' name, we pray that the words that would come forth, Lord, you would use them to pierce your hearts, to draw your people to you. Father, we pray right now that you would cease any distractions, anything we came in here with on our minds and our hearts, that you would cease those, that, that your spirit may speak and speak clearly. We pray that, you, Lord, in spirit, you would have your way. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. You know, they say perspective is everything. I don't know if you've heard such things as the glass is half full, or when you have lemons, make lemonade, or maybe you've heard the one that the grass always seems greener on the other side. You know, all these things are just a matter of perspective, how you choose to see them. And uh, I have to confess, please don't give me the side eye. We're just meeting today, so, so draw your judgment slowly. But, you know, one of the things that my husband and I do uh, to kind of decompress from our day is we, we watch TV together. We don't, we can just kind of chill and uh, relax. And we try to find a series that we can kind of watch and see through for a fair amount of time. Well, we finished our, we've caught up on everything that we were uh, kind of behind on, Grey's Anatomy and, and uh, 911, and, and so then he ditched me, and he went and watched his dude shows. So that left me to find something for myself. Now again, we're just meeting, so don't side-eye me, but the show that I stumbled on that I've started to watch, and maybe you're familiar with it, is called Married at First Sight. Y'all been watching it too, huh? Well, I'm, I'm new. I'm new. So Netflix just allowed me to kind of jump in at season 10. Uh, and I'm about 10 episodes into season 10. And I have to say, it's quite fascinating. And my husband, he won't jump in on it, maybe because he missed nine episodes, because I think he'd have to say it's fascinating too. And I know... We haven't grown up in a time and a day where there was these arranged marriage, maybe your grandparents or your great-grandparents, but that's, that's the premise of the show where they matchmake people and that the first time the man and the woman uh, meet their to-be spouse is when they're literally at the altar. They come to the altar and they don't even know the name of the man, of the, of the husband or the wife that, that they're about to say I do to. And they've gone through all these tests and everything and so the experts, whoever they are, a pastor, a psychologist, they've been matched. And the show's so interesting because when they get up there and they're googly-eyed about the person they've seen for all of 30 seconds, they're so, you know, awestruck. And in the show, within the second or third episode, they've been sent on their honeymoon. Now, the season that I'm watching, uh, they sent the, the couples to Panama for what seemed to be a few days, three or four days. And there's this one couple that really has started to irritate me. <laughs> it's, it's, I can't even remember their names, Brandon and somebody. Uh, but, but they were, the, 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 the woman, she was saying how much, she could see why they were paired together, but she can, she enjoys him so much. But he did something that kind of got on her nerves, go figure, on the honeymoon. And then so their vibe was all messed up, and she was irritated with them. And by the time they were about to get on the plane to go back to Washington, D.C., they were yelling, arguing, and cursing at each other. Now, they've known each other for all about five or six days at this point. And I don't know, there may be a few married people in the house, but marriage is hard work under the best of circumstances. When you've known the person for a little bit of time and you kind of think you like them, it is hard 
work. Amen. And y'all can talk back to me. It's okay. I broke the other crowd in this morning. And my husband and I, praise God, we've been married for 10 years. I know. Thank you. Yeah, give it up. That's hard work. And y'all don't know him. I mean, he'll smile. at He's cool, but it's hard work. <laughs> if you only knew what he was saying under his breath about me. <laughs> and we loved each other when we got married. These folks don't even know each other. But the thing that interests me, when they got back, this particular couple, when they got back from their honeymoon, and she was upset at him, go figure, the wife's upset at the husband, she made a video about the husband and all the things that she can't find in the man, and she was talking like she was single. Then their, their vibe was really jacked, if you can imagine. And they keep talking about, I just wish he would go back to being the person that he was on day two of their relationship when he was so nice and he was just so chill. But y'all barely, y'all don't even know each other full 30 days, let alone anything to really hold any clout. But isn't it funny how sometimes we get so zoned in on one thing or one aspect of a thing, and then when that gets thrown off, our whole perspective is jacked and shaded. And that's a little bit about what I want to talk about. Because if you've been married, you know that the person that you say I do with, a lot of times you get a year in and five years in and 30 years in is not the person that you once said I do with. But our perspective hopefully grows. Hopefully we evolve and we continue to follow the Lord together as the Lord develops us individually and as a unit. And I just want to suggest today that you see what you magnify. You see what you magnify. You know, when I was a kid, um, and I, you know, I, have, I have old parents, so which means I have like really old grandparents. And when I was a kid, I had a, a magnifying glass and I would take my grandfather's magnifying glass and you know, I look at things like the newspaper. Y'all know what that is? <laughs> and the, uh, the TV guide that would come in the weekly newspaper. Y'all know what that is? <laughs> and I would take the magnifying glass, and it was, it was not like they make them these days looking rectangular. It had a stick and then the big round, thick piece of glass, and I put it up there to try to see all that small print with my young eyes at the age of five years old. And the magnifying glass would take that which was there and enlarge it and make what was there easier to be seen. You know, today we find ourselves uh, in the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 34. But our, 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 per, our, our pericope today is in the backdrop of 1 Samuel chapter 21. And this is where Saul was trying to secure his throne for future generations, even though he already knew that it was coming to an end. You see, Saul was jealous and wanted, uh, jealous of David and wanted David killed. Where we pick up in the chapter, David is fleeing in, for his life from Saul. And David counters King Achish of Gath. King Achish seems to recognize David and says, isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances and say Saul has killed thousands, but David his tens of thousands? The Bible says that David took those words to heart and was very afraid so much that he pretended to be insane in their presence. The Bible says that he was acting like a madman, making marks on doors of the gates, letting saliva run down his beard. And it was this act that protected him and saved his life. You see, in this story of 1 Samuel 21, uh, it is the reason we have a Psalm chapter 34. It's the response of God and God's protection in David's life that's chronicled in 1 Samuel 21. So the first thing that I want to lift up from our Psalm 34 is that what we focus on, we magnify. And what we magnify, we make big. The Bible says, 
in our passage. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That's in the NRSV. But the NIV says, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. The NLT reads like this. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. You see, to magnify means to make great in size, to make great in scale, magnitude, or importance. And to exalt means to praise, to glorify, or to honor. It is to be high, to be lifted, or to be caused raised, to cause to raise up. Here, David, David invites us and admonishes us to make great in size the importance of the Lord. David admonishes us to praise, glorify, honor, lift up, or cause to be raised up the name of the Lord, who we know to be Jesus. David has given us instructions and directions on where to place our attention, our energy, and our focus. We are called to make big our God. We are called to shine the light and the focus and our energy and our attention directly on the Lord and not on our circumstances. We're called to activate our memory so that we can remind ourselves that our God is great and greatly to be praised. David calls us to lift high the name of Jesus. David calls us to raise high the name of Jesus. David calls us to honor the name of Jesus, and in doing so, we honor him. You see, we, we as people have a tendency to make big our situations that are right in front of us. But what does God call us to do? He calls us to live by faith and not by sight. He tells, us that the, he tells us that there's a spiritual world that's going on in a realm that we cannot see, but is very, very real. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against the rulers of the dark world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We have a tendency to focus on what we can see in the natural rather than trusting God about what he's doing in the supernatural. I want to ask the question today, do we make our problems big? In your world, are your problems bigger than your God? Are your problems bigger than the God who said, let there be and there was? Are your problems bigger than the God who traveled with the Israelites during this wilder their wilderness season and provided a cloud by day and a fire by night? Are, you, are your problems bigger than the God who caused the Red Sea to split and swallowed up the enemies in the Red Sea? Are your problems bigger than the God who created uh, the planet Earth, which is amazing within itself? Are your problems bigger than the God who has created what we know as humans in 2022 as 5,000 exoplanets, which are foreign worlds beyond our solar system? He, we here on planet live in the Milky Way galaxy. Our solar system, they say, was formed 4.6 billion years ago. We know that we have eight planets in ours, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Mars. There are nine dwarf planets and 1,199,224 minor planets. Are your problems bigger than that God? The Hubble reveals that there's an estimated 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Let me say that number again. I don't, I, how many zeros is that? Wouldn't be, it wouldn't be bad to have those many zeros in my bank account, but hey, who's complaining? 100 billion galaxies in the universe. But they say that this number is likely to increase to 200 billion as the telescope technology in space improves. Again, let me say 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Are your problems bigger than the God who created over 100 billion galaxies? You see, I don't know. I mean, it's quite easy to get really zoned in on Earth 
and all that goes on in our world that we can see is really easy to get zoned in on all that we can just see it with our myopic eye, let alone you put a telescope out and you see so far. But I'm talking about 100 billion galaxies. If the God of the universe and the God of creation can, has the wherewithal to create 100 billion galaxies, how much more can he do for you or for I when we find ourselves in trouble and in desperation? How much more can he do for you or for I when you find yourself you don't know how you're going to pay this or pay that or are your children on the right track or where are they going to school or what about this and I lost my job. We're talking about the God of the universe who created more than a hundred billion galaxies. Where are we putting our focus and is our God not bigger than that? Or I want to ask her, do you magnify your God to remind you that your God is bigger than what seems to be the greatest of your troubles? Again, as, past, as uh, Pastor Tracy said last week, which I love so much, when she said that my circumstances are not the mark of God's goodness, the cross is. And isn't that such a beautiful way to keep grounded and reminded in the truth? that no matter the difficulty, the catastrophe, or the desperation we find ourselves in, that God's character is not classified by what's going on in our life, but we see the character in the hand of God when we look at the cross. You know, I think it's so easy that we get what I like to call spiritual amnesia. And... Um, we forget so quickly and so easily not only where we've come from, but what God has done with us, through us, and in our life. You know, they say that there's three things that oftentimes strain a marriage. Y'all may be familiar. You may have had conversations about them just yesterday. Money, sex, and children. And, uh, you know, I was just uh, having a conversation with my husband this past week that actually led me to this Psalm 34, if I'm, if I'm honest with you. Um, and uh, you can show the first picture. This is our family. Don't we look so put together? <laughs> Don't we look like we know something about what we're doing? Look at all them cheesy smiles. You think any of them wanted to do this photo shoot that I set up? In the summertime in Pennsylvania last year? No, no, we were sweating a lot, sweating a lot. Um, so that's our family. That's my husband, Lamont, in the big blue shirt. That's my two boys in those striped shirts. You think they like dressing alike like that? No, yeah, they don't. As long as I can do it, I will. <laughs> Until they outgrow it. Um, and uh, so Lamont and I, again, we've been married 10 years. Praise God, we're plowing through it. It's all good. And um, yeah, yeah, don't we? <laughs> Beautiful couple. Yeah. That's how it looks at the photo shoot. You don't know, we're probably strangling our kids right before they snap that picture. <laughs> photo shoot, the, off the notes just for 30 seconds. Photo shoots are so fake. I mean, you're yelling at your kids and then they say smile and then you get these beautiful pictures. Um, you know, but we've, we've been in Maryland. We came back to uh, my hometown. We we're in Calvert County. Oh, yeah, those boys, yeah. yeah love they look like they love each other. <laughs> and they do for the most part. They do. They do. They do. But they maybe were strangling each other before she said to smile, too. We came back to Maryland about three and a half years ago from Ohio, and we had been discerning the call to plant, plant a church, uh, and we were discerning our where. And uh, when we finally had clarity about our where we were supposed to come to, uh, we, the Lord had directed us to Maryland. I said I was never coming back to where I grew up. Isn't God funny? He's so, so funny. Ha, ha, ha. And um, so we came back to, to Maryland. And but before we got to Maryland, uh, I was working at Kent State University. My husband was at the University of Akron. And again, the Lord's super funny. Somebody should put him up on stage uh, because cause I lost my job. I lost my job. Out the blue, one of those Friday afternoons, you get called into your boss's office at four o'clock in the afternoon only to get the pink slip, totally out the blue. And so when we were planning to come back to Maryland, say in the spring, 
I lost my job in October. Now, we had already discerned that God was calling us back to Maryland, but I thought after the school year was done, God, that'd make a lot more sense than October, just clip, clip, no job. And uh, again, God was funny, and God had a way of doing things that was clearly not my way. So we were in the midst of quick transition very quickly. Because what's the point of being in, in Ohio when God's calling you to Maryland? How can you plant anything in Maryland when you're rooted in Ohio? So we thought, well, the Lord is moving us out of Ohio quicker than we thought, quicker than I thought. I think my husband knew something was happening quicker. Um, and uh, so we're packing up and trying to figure things out. And we get to uh, Maryland in January, a few months later, And it's not like we had jobs lined up, because again, the Lord uprooted me really quickly. So we said, well, we'll stay and move in with my mom until we get ourselves on on our feet. So my husband had the idea he was going to be an Uber and Lyft driver full time. He researched it and said he could make a lot of money with it. He was gone from the house 12 hours a day. I was with two little boys. Those little boys were not in school. Stay at home, mom. I prayed for that at one time. I don't know what I was thinking then. bit off way more than I was, you know, was not built for it. Kudos to all the stay-at-home moms. God bless you all. Double portion of everything because send me, send me back to school. So um, stay-at-home mom, finishing up my graduate degree. My husband's working 12 hours to make ends meet. We're moved at home, quick transition, trying to figure out our finances. Two, two incomes down to one, but if you work Uber and Lyft, it wasn't even a full income that we were used to. We were in a lot of transition, and it was very challenging. That season got us into some debt because our ends weren't meeting, uh, not because we were just spending money wildly. That wasn't happening. And so we were having a conversation. Now, I don't know about you, but we're trying to do something with our life. We're trying to follow God. We're trying to be successful on God's terms. And that can lead you to always having goals, right? And you're working towards something and you're trying to do something, but you never seem to be quite there. And that's the conversation that my husband and I were having this week. He's here today. He wasn't here at the nine o'clock service. Feel free to get the details from him later. I'm sure he'll give you the exciting stuff. Yeah, (laughs) woohoo. But we were having the conversation, and um, one of us was disgruntled about where we are, and we weren't quite where we wanted to be. And the other one, who was trying to be an Ephesians 5 wife, was trying to say, (laughs) But thank God (laughs) we're not where we once were. Thank God that He's filled in, he's provided in ways that we can't explain. Thank God you don't have to drive Lyft and Uber full time anymore and you have a job and I have a lot of side hustles and God is doing something. Um, And so it was a matter of talking through perspective. And so you can go to the next picture, the the Sandy ones. So we we were very blessed. I know we have a Sandy picture. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. We got to take a little trip to Ocean City a few weeks ago where we got a lot of sand in our bathing suits and ate a lot of sugary food and they want to take pictures of you at the beach. And, um, and guess what? I, had to, I said to my husband, we weren't going to Ocean City, Maryland two years ago. Our finances weren't there. Now our finances are not amazing, but praise God, he's doing the work. Praise God, he's supplying for our need. And sometimes my son lost his first tooth biting into a corn dog on the boardwalk. I thought he swallowed it, so where, where's your tooth? And then that was the picture. Um, but sometimes we see what we magnify. If we magnify all where we're not and where we're not yet and what we don't have, that's what seems so big. Sometimes if we magnify where we've come from and where God has supplied, then that seems, it's what we, what we put that magnifying glass up to when we're trying to read the small print. And sometimes we can forget from where God has brought us from, even if it's not the end destination. We are not at our end destination, but I thank God my husband isn't driving Uber 12 hours a day and we can take a little family trip to Ocean City 
where my son wants to buy a sweatshirt with a piranha on the front of it, being ferocious. So what we see, what we magnify. The Bible tells us to magnify the Lord and to exalt his holy name. And I dare to say that if we have the courage to, to put the magnifying glass on God, it changes our perspective no matter what our situation is. The second thing I want to lift up from our text today is that the Bible says that he rewards those who diligently seek him. He rewards those who diligently seek him. In our passage, it says, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their fears are never covered in shame. When we seek the Lord, we find the Lord. And let me say that again so it can sink in. When we seek the Lord, we find the Lord. We will find that he will set us free from our fear. When we seek the Lord, we find a God who delivers us from shame. When we seek the Lord, we find a God who guards and defends us. When we seek the Lord, we find a God who shows us his goodness. When we seek the Lord, we find a God who will supply what we need. When we seek the Lord, we find a God who will listen when we talk to him. When we seek the Lord, we find a God who redeems us. The question I want to ask you all to consider and reflect upon in your own life is who or what are you seeking after? Who or what are you seeking after? Who or what is it that who or what is it that you believe will rescue you from your situation? Who or what is it that you believe that will ease your pain in life? Who or what is it that you look to for comfort, console, and courage to take the next step? Some of us look to money to be our provider and our source, rather than understanding that it is Jehovah Jireh that is our true source. Some of us look to food, sex, alcohol, or weed to be our comfort and to ease our anxiety. Some of us look to people before we look to God to be our safe ear and to be our defender. Yet I'm here to tell you that there's no one who can come close to your defender greater than our God. That there's no one who can set you free from the demons of your past that is greater than our God. Maybe, maybe a people and a follower of Jesus, may we be a people and a follower of Jesus who seeks him first, who we allow to lead us first and be the ultimate healer of our heart, our soul, and our brokenness. The last thing that I want to lift up from our passage today that our text shows us is that fear of the Lord provides provision. Fear of the Lord provides provision. In our verses uh, today, 8 through 10, it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. You see, these verses are an invitation. That taste and see that the Lord is good, that's an invitation that simply just says, hey, try this, I know you will like it. There's nothing to lose and all to gain when we take refuge in the Lord. To fear the Lord means to honor and reverence the Lord. It doesn't mean to be scared of God. That word fear is more to, to honor and to reverence the Lord. It's a promise that when we honor the Lord and reverence the Lord, that the Lord shows up in our life, in our situation, and provides for us. David exclaims a promise that we can take, take to the bank and cash it in. And that is that our God provides for our every need when we honor him. The New Testament puts it like this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
all the provisions that you need, your food, your money, the comfort, whatever you need, your necessities of life, those things will be added to you. Don't go looking for this and for that. Don't go looking for more money. Go looking for the kingdom of God. Go looking for the one who provides what you need. Go looking for the one who fills your gap. Go looking. And in the kingdom of God, there is supplication there. Paul says it like this. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I want to encourage you to honor the Lord for there is provision when you're struggling. I want to encourage you to honor the Lord for there's provision when you're doubting. I want to encourage somebody today to honor the Lord for there's provision when you're confused and you don't know which way to go. I want to encourage you to honor the Lord for there's provision when you think that you don't have enough. The Bible is full of examples of how God makes ways where there seems to be no way. I want to encourage somebody today to honor the Lord for there's provision when you feel alone. We know we have a God who's not left us. He's not forsaken us. He's not abandoned us. He sticks closer than a brother, closer than a brother the Bible says. I want to encourage you today to taste and see that the Lord is good because there's blessing and provision where we can, take, where we can learn to take refuge in the Lord. Amen. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for being a provider. We thank you for being one who steps in and never leaves us, God. We thank you for the call that when we make you big, you show up and our problems have to bow down. Any, anything that the enemy puts at our feet has to bow down. That at the name of Jesus, the demons tremble. And Lord, we thank you for there is salvation in your name. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is wholeness in the name of Jesus. May we lift you up and magnify you. And may we know without a shadow of doubt that you are greater than anything we come across. We pray these things in the name that saves Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.